26. In a few moments, we're going to be looking at verses 47 through 56. We have come to the point in our study in the Gospel of Matthew where we're moving toward the crucifixion and resurrection. We're going to spend uh, some time over the next weeks looking at what took place in just a few hours, just a short period of time. We, we've already looked at the Passover meal, the Last Supper, and before 24 hours has passed from that point, Jesus will have been crucified, dead, and placed in the tomb. <clears throat> During the Passover meal, Jesus announced to one of his disciples, or he announced that one of his disciples was going to betray him. The time was short. Jesus would be executed the next day. He couldn't be executed on the Sabbath. So if they left him in the jail, if they arrested him in the Garden of Gethsemane and they left him in the jail till the day after the Sabbath, it's more than likely there would have been a great scene made about it. The Jewish leaders were facing a very small window of opportunity to pull off what they planned to do, and that's the execution of Christ. But of course, we know this all was according to God's plan. The only way they could do this was with a hurried trial, a very early morning meeting with the Sanhedrin to confirm the verdict of death, and then a Roman trial, because they couldn't crucify anyone on their own. It had to come from the Roman government. This miscarriage of justice by the hurried proceedings is, is staggering. You think about what takes place in our justice system today. This whole process of less than 24 hours is played out over a period of years and years and years in our justice system. When we last left our study of Matthew a couple weeks ago, we had just finished looking at Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He went out after the, the meal, after the Passover supper, and he took them into the olive grove, into the Garden of Gethsemane, and and. He said, wait here while I go and pray. And he went a little while, a little short distance further. And he took three disciples with him. And they couldn't keep their eyes open. And he, he, he pled with the Father. If there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And then he would go back and, and ask them, wake up. Can't you even watch for an hour? And this took place three times. And that brings us to our account today. He had just woken the disciples for the last time, and we pick it up in verses 47 through 56. And even as Jesus said this, Judas, one of the twelve disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. They had been sent by the leading priests and elders of the people. The traitor, Judas, had given them a prearranged signal. You'll know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. So Judas came straight to Jesus. Jesus, greetings, Rabbi, he exclaimed, and gave him a kiss. Jesus said, my friend, go ahead and do what you come for. When well, the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him, then the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him, but one of the men with Jesus pulled out a sword and struck the high priest's slave, slashing off his ear. Put away your sword, Jesus told him. Those who use the sword will die by the sword. Don't you realize I could have asked my father for thousands of angels to protect us and he would have sent them instantly? But if I did, how would the scriptures be fulfilled that describe what must now happen? Then Jesus said to the crowd, Am I some dangerous revolutionary that you come with swords and clubs to arrest me? Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there teaching every day. But this is all happening to fulfill the words of the prophets as recorded in the scriptures. At that point, all the disciples deserted him and fled. So, there's a lot going on here. So I want to just for a few minutes just look at the principal players of this scene. First, we have Judas. It seems clear that Judas was... His job, going with these men, was to identify Jesus in the night. Now, even though it was a full moon, Passover always takes place at the first full moon after the spring equinox. So, even though it was full moon, and these men had seen Jesus every day teaching in the temple, they, they were not taking any chances. They wanted Judas to 
point him out. So he does. He identifies him with a kiss. R.C. Sproul, in his commentary, he, he adds some perspective on what happened here. He writes, so much is wrong with this picture. First, Judas came up to Jesus saying, greetings, Rabbi. Then he kissed him. In the ancient Jewish world, there were certain protocols that were observed in the rabbi-student relationship, and these rules were never to be disobeyed. One of those rules was this. If a rabbi met one of the students on the street, the rabbi was always to speak first, extending his greetings to the student because the student is never above the master. It was considered ex exceedingly rude, presumptuous, and, and arrogant for a student to speak to his rabbi before the rabbi spoke to him. The rabbi always initiated the greeting. In the midst of this treachery, <coughs> Judas violates this fundamental rule of courtesy. So this act of presumption and disrespect, it shows us exactly how hardened Judas's heart was for what he had prepared to do. And that's the danger for all of us when we live making sinful choices. Sin is like any other addiction. We, we, we tell ourselves and we actually believe that, oh, I can stop that anytime I want to. But the thing is, is the more you do it, the more you become involved in it, the more calloused, the more hardened your heart is until you have deadened your conscience. And before long, you have come to the point where you can justify anything and everything that you do and feel like there's nothing wrong with it. That's what's going on in the world of the modern church today. Hearts have been hardened. Consciousness has been deadened to the truth of God's word. And sometimes, as we see with Judas, the cruelest wounds that are inflicted upon us come from some of our closest friends. Ever had a friend pull you aside and, and say, now it's only because I love you so much that, that I'm going to tell you this. Well, they're getting ready to, get ready to blast you is what they're getting ready to do. Always be careful with that. Now, perhaps we are hurt the most by friends when they betray us because... They have the information to use against us. They know our weak points. They know our faults. They know our failures. And they know what buttons to push to accomplish their goal. Now, Jesus didn't have any weak points, but he did have some close companions. And Judas, <coughs> and he just flat out hardened his heart to who Jesus was, to what he meant to the world, and he betrayed him. And then we see the arresting party. Matthew tells us that there was a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. In the Gospel of John, in chapter 18, we get some, some further details. John writes, The leading priests and Pharisees had given Judas a contingent of Roman soldiers and temple guards to accompany him. Now with blazing torches, lanterns, and weapons, they arrived at the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, in the English, that phrase, contingent of Roman soldiers... In, in the Greek, that refers to a pretty large number of people. But here it, it's included with guards of the temple, the Jewish guard for the temple, and the Roman cohort. So this was a group of Roman foot soldiers. Likely it was part of a cohort. I can't see them sending a whole cohort, which was 400 to 600 men. It took 10 cohorts to make up a legion. We'll talk about that more talk about the angels in a minute. But it's unlikely that the Romans would have sent an entire cohort to arrest one single man who was with 12, uh, 11 other men in that. But either way, it shows that they were not taking any chances. The Jewish leaders didn't skimp on the amount of people that they took to arrest Jesus. Why? Well, it's possible that they didn't know how many people were going to be with him in the garden. And they wanted to make sure there was no resistance. But it's also possible that they were intimidated because deep down they knew who Jesus was. It's possible that they had witnessed a lot of the things that Jesus had done. I mean, after all, this was a man that did things outside of their power, outside of their reasoning. They had seen him make lame people walk again. They had, make him, they had, they had seen him make blind people see, lepers cleansed, Jews. 
dead people alive. How could they go up against that? So they took enough to make sure that they would be able to get him. They were determined not let him get away this time. And then we have the disciples. Just a couple minutes before this, they couldn't hold their eyes open. They were sleepy. They're wide awake now. I suspect they were terrified. When the arresting officers grabbed Jesus, the Gospel of John tells us that it was Peter who was furious, and he pulled out his sword, and he, and he took an aim at, at one, of the, one of the men's heads. He wasn't trying to cut off his ear. He was trying to cut off his head. He was going to kill him. The servant must have caught a glimpse of it, moved out of the way just in time, and, and lost his ear. Peter was very serious about defending Jesus to the death. Before chaos and killing ensued, and all the disciples would have been killed at that point, Jesus put a stop to the violence. He put the man's ear back on, healed him. Even this miracle didn't deter the mob. Jesus told Peter that drawing his sword was, was, was unwise because those who use the sword or live by the sword will die by the sword. Now, a lot of people over the years have taken that comment by Jesus to think that we should not defend ourselves, that, that our country should not have a military power. That's not what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is simply saying that violence provokes violence. You ever got into an argument with somebody? They raise their voice, what do you do? You raise your voice. They stand up, what do you do? You stand up. They puff up, you puff up, right? You're not gonna be outdone. Jesus says that that doesn't get anywhere. That doesn't solve anything. Secondly, Jesus told him that the sword was unnecessary. Jesus didn't need Peter's sword. If he wanted help, all he had to do was call out to the Father. Say the word and the soldiers would be toast. The Greek text that says that Jesus could call 12 legions of angels. Now a legion is 10 cohorts. A cohort is 40, 400 to 600 soldiers. So in this case, Jesus could have called in a second. 50 to 70,000 angels to be right there. Jesus was telling his disciples that no amount of soldiers could take him if he wasn't willing to go. But he was. Third, Jesus said that pulling out the sword, Peter, you made a mistake. Peter was trying to keep Jesus from doing what he came to do. And in essence, that means he was fighting against the Father's will. And we know that is never a good idea, to go against the Father's will. The death of Jesus was necessary for him to accomplish his purpose. Not just any death. I mean, it wouldn't have been the same if Jesus had just fallen over dead. Had to be his way. Had to be the Lamb of God, slain for the sins of all men. Now, when Jesus arrested, was arrested, the disciples did what? They ran. I'm not so sure that this wasn't something that was probably a good thing. Jesus didn't train these men to die with him. He trained them to take the gospel into all the world, to preach and teach and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But it still, it had to be painful when he watched them turn and run. Max Licata, you know, he's one of my favorite authors. He, he writes it as only he can in his book, Just Like Jesus. He says, all of them pledged loyalty, and yet we all ran. From the outside looking in, we see it as betrayal. The disciples have left him. The people have rejected him, and God hasn't heard it. Never has so much trash been dumped on one being. Stack all the disloyalties of deadbeat dads and cheating wives and prodigal kids and dishonest workers in one pile, and you might begin to see what Jesus had to face that night. From a human point of view, Jesus' world had collapsed. No answer from heaven, no help from the people, and no loyalty from his friends. And that, friends, is a sad reminder of the human condition. 
We make all kinds of boast of loyalty while things are going good. But when things get difficult, when we meet opposition, when there's a cost to our faith that's greater than what we can easily pay, what do we do? We run away. We run away. We abandon that which we said was most important in our lives. In the times of conflict, we find out what really is most important in our lives. In our Sunday school lesson, uh, Chip Ingram has been teaching uh, on how to raise effective children in a defective world. And he says, number one and first and foremost, your children must see that God is the most important thing in your life. We have to be fervent. We have to sure up before... It all hits the fan. What's number one in our life? Who is number one? Are we going to stand with God or are we going to run away? And then we see the figure that's in the spotlight, Jesus. A man who had been so anguished just a few moments earlier that he sweat drops of blood. He was under so much pressure. But now he stands fearless. First notice that he doesn't recoil from Judas. I imagine that Jesus looked Judas right in the eye. I mean, I, I mean, can't you just hear Jesus saying, with a kiss? Really? Really, with a kiss. You know, why don't you say, there he is. But you're going to make it worse. You're going to betray me with a kiss. I would imagine the look of Jesus looking into Judas's eyes and the sound of his voice saying, my friend, do what you come to do. That would haunt Judas for the rest of his very short life. But he called Judas his friend. I don't think that was sarcasm. I think even after Judas has done what he's done, that Jesus loved him enough to die for him. My friend. Secondly, notice that Jesus steps toward the soldiers. He didn't cower. He didn't hide behind a tree. He didn't look for a way of escape. He stepped forward because he was certain that this was his father's will. And once again, in John 18, we have more, more detail. John adds, Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Who do you seek? And they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with him. When Jesus said this to them, when he said, I am he, they drew back and they fell on the ground. So Jesus asked them again, who do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. Now, that phrase, I am he, is a little deceptive. Because in the Greek, there is no he that's in this part. Who do you seek? Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus says, I am. Remember when Moses was encountering the burning bush and God spoke to him and said, go to Pharaoh and tell him to turn my, my people loose. Let them go. Free them from slavery. And Moses said, well, if I go to Pharaoh and tell him that, he's going to say, who sent you? And God said, I am. I am. So Jesus is telling them, I am. And it had such an impact on them that the ones that came to arrest him fell down on their faces. So he, can't you just imagine Jesus going over and saying, I ask you again, who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth? I am. <clears throat> and then he says, take me and let these men go. Jesus was protecting his friends. He was protecting the cause of the gospel. He diffused a potential bloody conflict by rebuking Peter and healing the, the servant's ear of the high priest. And he acted quickly before tempers flared and people died. Jesus even took some time to rebuke the Jewish leaders of their army. It's, it was as if he's saying, why all this cloak and dagger stuff? Why send the SWAT team? Have I ever been violent? No. Didn't you have 
plenty of opportunities to arrest me in public. For goodness sakes, I was at the temple every day teaching. Jesus let them know that he knew they were engaged in a cowardly and illegal plot, that their motives were clear. They didn't pull anything over on them, but yet, he says, let's go. And all the chaos, and all the betrayal, and all the disappointment, Jesus saw this moment as a necessary part of God's eternal plan. Max Locato, once again, he says, that is how Jesus chose to view the storm that came his way. Necessary turbulence in the plan of God. Where others saw gray skies, Jesus saw a divine order. His suffering was necessary to fulfill prophecy. And his sacrifice was necessary to fulfill the law. How could Jesus have this perspective in the middle of chaos and disappointment? I mean, in just a few short moments, he had gone from being anguished to being fearless to being under arrest. In his human nature, Jesus found the proper perspective for what he's going through on his knees in prayer with the Father. You know, we can muster courage. We can try and develop a positive mental attitude about things that we're faced with because these are all tricks of our mind. Jesus was calm. He was aware. He was confident because he had spent time in preparation in prayer before it happened. He waited until his will and his heart was in complete sync with God's will. Most of the time, we're in such a hurry, we want simple solutions. We are, we're used to turning to God for answers and our friends uh, and to, to Google and all those things for prevailing wisdom and, and quick fixes for what's facing us. And even as we grow in our faith, we, we still tend to consult books rather than spend the time that we need in prayer waiting on the Lord's will to be revealed to us. We labor to figure things out in our own power rather than to simply listen for the Holy Spirit to speak to us. And here, Jesus gives us the exact example of what we need to be when we're faced, when we're hit head on by the storms and crises of life. When we encounter a frightening diagnosis, when we are in the midst of financial devastation, when we are in the middle of a legal proceeding, when we are attacked unjustly, when we have a threat to our livelihood, when there's a rupture in our marriage or our family relationships, when we are suffered a devastating loss, folks, we find our greatest strength not in a formula, not in alliance with friends and family. Our greatest strength comes from spending time on our knees before the Lord God Almighty. Amen? Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Seeking His will. Prayer is our greatest resource. So this is a powerful moment here. In these heated moments, Jesus shows that his trust is in God's will. He also showed his overwhelming love for us and for his disciples. So let's try and draw some takeaways from this sober moment being played out in the garden. First, you will never be able to stand the storms of life until you have settled the matter of who is most important to you. As long as we continue to try and ride the waves of cultural consensus and opinion of other people, we'll be without a root system for the storms of our life. Nothing to anchor deep to. When we are most concerned about preserving ourselves and defending our rights and our reputation, we will continue to find God's strength elusive for us. Like Jesus, we must come to the point where we say, not my will, but your will be done, Father. And that is not a prayer of resignation. That's not a last-ditch effort. That, my friends, is a prayer of faith that acknowledges that God's wisdom is far greater than our own, and we acknowledge that His way is always the way. Secondly, you got to know that people are going to disappoint you. Not only that, but you better know that you're going to disappoint people too. As long as you expect other people to always do what you want them to do, 
or what you expect them to do, or even to do what you are convinced is right, you're going to spend a lot of time being disappointed. The sooner we accept this fact that the, the sinful bent of the human heart is there, it's easier to remain at peace in the tumultuous times of life. It also makes it easier to restore relationships after the disappointments. It's wise to recognize that even after we come to faith in Christ, we still have stains. We still have the habits of the sinful life. Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him. He knew that his disciples weren't failing. He knew they were disappointed. But he loved them. Loved them. And he made sure that these remaining disciples, that the relationship with him was restored. After his resurrection, he went to them. Especially to Peter, we see it played out because Peter had repeatedly denied him. Do you love me, Peter? <clears throat> you know I do, Lord. I know you do too. Be my sheep. That's what Jesus told him. Restored the relationship with him, even though they failed him in the garden. Third, the greatest resources that we have at hand are prayer and God's word. Imagine being a fireman. You're called in the middle of the night to a, to a huge house fire and you arrive and your tanker full of water and you get out and you run up to the house and you start spitting on it. You take your coat off and you start trying to fan the, knock the flames down. Your greatest resource is behind you. You're not using it. That would be silly, wouldn't it? That would be silly. Well, listen, if you're not carving out time every day, multiple times each day, to spend time with God in prayer and in God's word, you are spitting on the fire. You are not using your greatest resources. But they're only great tools if we use them. Hard times are going to come in your life. There's no, no disputing that. I remember Charlotte Butler telling me one time, Something had happened in her family. I don't remember what it was. And she just said, David, it's our turn. She said, it might be your turn next week. She said, but it's my turn. It, it hits us all. Life throws us curveballs. We have hardships and struggles. Every one of us, it's going to be our turn at some point. We need to be preparing for our turn right now. I encourage you to block out time every day to meet with I am. <clears throat> Read his word. Reflect on it. Bring to the Lord the things that weigh most heavily on your heart. Instead of checking in on Facebook for the 150th time today, check in on God's word. See what God's got to say about it. Instead of reading the newspaper, or turning on Fox News or CNN or any of those things, how about uh, spend some time in prayer? Talking with God, listening to God's word. Instead of hitting the snooze button five times in the morning, get up and get in the word for a few minutes. Choose to put God first in your day. If you'll commit to do that for even a short time, a month, I believe that you'll find that that is the most significant time and the most important time of your day. And it may not make you strong enough to stand up to an entire legion of soldiers in a dark garden, but then again, it is not. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn. What a friend we have in Jesus.